Yep. Oh, you don't have to up. You can just close it. You can just close my laptop if you don't want to. Okay. His Are you ready to roll, you think? A millimeter above his chest, so as long as he doesn't bend, he'll be good. <laughs> yeah, Dr. Keller, don't bend. Whatever you do, don't bend. Oh, if it does does do the, the feedback noise, touch it to unground it and then get it away from your skin or body. Touch the, the touch microphone the mic, portion yeah. and For just some reason that works. Away. Yeah. Okay. Good. Let's see if that works. I'll let you practice. Well, there's some pretty brutal hits in this. Looking to have you correct the line. Do you do psychological skill? Yes, how much to it it should all run through the HDMI cable. I'm not sure what took a while to start. What do you do? We have ACSM or ATA meetings. What are you doing here? This is perfect. You're seeing me stuff. You know, you guys are setting up a pretty tough act to follow. <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> no, it's you. <laughs> I'm just a comic relief in between. So we start on time. Should we stop the video a little bit ahead of eight? Uh, seven, yeah. Oh, sorry, uh, sorry. Yeah. So can you pause it here in a oh, second? We'll just stop whenever we want. Okay. And you're ready to go. Stop. Yeah. I mean, we've got about another minute and a half. Okay. Used to be in radio, so I try to hit my marks. Yeah. We're good, we are. Mm -hmm. Looking good to go. Oh, good. All right. I just have, let's see, about one minute to go. Okay. The only reason I'm delaying is I think I don't know how soon they start early on the videotaping. Oh. So I try to hit that 7 o'clock so when they start the videotaping. And the other thing is they stop taping at 8.30. And then at 9 o'clock, I still look at this to people. No, we've never had anybody really stay till 9. But it's a so-called smart classroom, so the door's locked so that you can exit. But if you leave anything in here, you can't get back in. So I'll kind of warn people in case they really want to be here. So it's kind of disconcerting to have a classroom smarter than you. You know, I think that's an unfair advantage. It's not a level playing field. Yeah. 
All right. Well, good evening. It's 7 o'clock, and I'm Robert Hannon for University of Alaska Fairbanks Summer Sessions, and I welcome you to Concussions and Alaska's New Laws on Management Around or uh, on Management. Um, it's kind of ironic that the tail end of the series deals with the head. I don't know, there might be something <laughs> profound in there. I'm not certain. Before I introduce our panelists tonight and presenters, I'd like to mention a couple of things. Number one, you guys who've been here regularly know, silence those cell phones. And if you haven't been regulars, you can silence them too. Uh, a couple of other things coming up in the tail end of uh, the wonderful season uh, UA of Summer Sessions has presented. Tomorrow, it's Call of the Wild Adventures in Alaska's Arctic Wilderness. Frank Klein is presenting. He's a writer, anthropologist, and environmental activist. That's tomorrow night at 7 o'clock here in this venue. And then Thursday, the final concert at the Jorgensen Botanical Gardens takes place, and a very fine uh, local band, E.T. Barnett String Band, performs some great bluegrass tunes for you. So you don't want to miss that. So without further ado, let me introduce tonight's panelists, a very distinguished group of people presenting tonight. Dr. Keller, who's standing to my right, your left, uh, attended medical school as well as did his surgical internship and orthopedic surgical residency at the University of Chicago. He founded the Center of Sports Medicine there. Dr. Keller then joined the United States Olympic Committee's medical training site where he did his sports medicine fellowship in arthroscopic and reconstructive ligament surgery of the knee. During that time, he served as associate, uh, associate team physician to the 1984 United States Olympic soccer team. Dr. Keller is the founder and medical director of Sports Medicine Fairbanks. Among his many accomplishments, he's a fellow and former trustee of the American College of Sports Medicine, he serves as team physician for the University of Alaska Fairbanks and for the Fairbanks area high school teams. And he served as chairman of the Arctic Winter Games Medical Committee and as team physician for Team Alaska. He's a founding member and past president of the Alaska Regional Chapter of the American College of Sports Medicine. And he's um, an advanced trauma life support instructor for the state of Alaska, so Dr. Keller. Also participating tonight, Laura, Dr. Laura Brunner. She's become part of the Tanana Valley Clinic's pediatric team in September of 2009. She specializes in pediatrics and participates in children health care. She attained a medical degree from the University of Minnesota Medical School and received a bachelor's in genetics and cell biology and mathematics from the University of Minnesota College of Biological Sciences. She did her internship and residency at the Children's Hospital of Denver, Colorado. She's board certified by the American Board of Pediatrics and a member of the American Medical Association and the American Academy of Pediatrics. She enjoys cooking the outdoors and spending time with her family. Please welcome Dr. Brunner. Also, this gentleman seated here in the vest is um, Charles Dean. He is a certified athletic trainer. He also serves as community outreach liaison and head athletic trainer for West Valley High School, District 10 representative for NATA, and I won't even guess what the other initials stand for. You can tell us that, Chris, when you get up here. He's president of the Alaska State Alathic, uh, Alath excuse me, Athletic Trainers Association. Please welcome Christopher Dean. And finally, Jennifer Glorioso is Director of Nursing Services at the Fairbanks North Star Borough School District. Please welcome her as well. So each will present um, a little something, and then at the end of that, if you have another engagement, you're welcome to leave at that time. Otherwise, then they'll get in the hot seats, and you can and ask them some questions. I've got this elbow that I really hope they'll address here tonight. Anyway, Dr. Keller, please take over. Thank you, Robert. I appreciate the kind words. <clears throat> Tell me who's uh, here tonight. Uh, we have uh, parents of athletes, perhaps? 
We have other, good, yes. other medical professionals in the room. Good, a few of those. Um, coaches, athletes, good. Well, I thank each of you for coming, um, uh, especially on such a, a nice evening. And uh, I want to take this chance to thank my powers for suggesting that we all get together. Here's the plan. You'll hear from me for a little bit about concussions, the law and its application. And then we'll um, ask Dr. Bruner to join us, and she'll talk about what you can expect when you take your son or daughter to visit a pediatrician or a family physician for the care of their concussion. And then uh, Chris Dean and Jennifer Glorioso, who you've just met, will join us, and they'll talk to us about how uh, nurses in the school district and athletic trainers can assist um, uh, primary care providers in taking care of concussions. And finally, we'll have a uh, panel discussion and we'll present you some case studies. So this is your big chance to be doctors and to figure out the answers to the case studies. And fortunately, the panel will help you. Um, so since there's a, a lot to go through, let's get started. And I'll ask you to save uh, questions for the end. So following the lead of the Zach Lystead law in the state of Washington, Alaska passed House Bill 15 in the spring of 2011, reminding us to take good care of athletes with concussions. Now all 50 states have passed concussion laws. Several important groups pushed hard for the law in Alaska, and today the Fairbanks Memorial Hospital and the University of Alaska Fairbanks bring us together to help you understand the law and how it is applied throughout Alaska. I want to spend most of our time talking about concussions and their management, but first let's make sure you understand the law and what is legally required of you. The Alaska law requires that school districts and ASA, the Alaska School Activities Association, collaborate to determine policies for the management of student athletes with concussion and to provide education about concussion for student athletes, parents, coaches, and school personnel. By law, an athlete with a suspected concussion must be removed from play and evaluated by a qualified person. And we all share the responsibility to make sure that that happens. In Alaska, a qualified person is a certified athletic trainer or other health care provider licensed in Alaska a federal health care provider, since they don't need to be licensed in Alaska, or a person working under the supervision of a physician, which was intended to include village health aides. By law, the return to play process has to follow a specific protocol, and when the protocol is complete, that qualified health care provider gives written clearance for the athlete to resume competition. We all share the responsibility to make sure that the return to play process is followed honestly. Let's stop there. Is that much clear about the law? Okay. The law further requires each qualified provider to self-certify in writing that they are trained in the evaluation and management of concussion. Also provided a definition of trained, which schools throughout the state must follow. First, to be a qualified and trained provider, one must have completed the CDC physician concussion course in the last two years. And second, one needs to have completed two hours of sports concussion CME, continuing medical education, in the last two years, or have completed specialized training in sports medicine, neurology, or neurosurgery. Again, I want to make sure you understand that part of the law. Good? Okay. Also has included a page in their website so that qualified and trained healthcare providers who wish to care for student athletes with concussion can enter their name and address. The list is for your convenience. It's not intended to be all inclusive or to imply endorsement. So the law says who can make decisions about concussions. And it says that a protocol has to be followed in order to return to play. To understand the protocol, we need to know a little bit about concussions. 
we're going to talk about several aspects of concussions briefly. And it all leads up to understanding the return to play protocol. The issue of concussions seems to be everywhere. We talk about it, we worry about it. Concussions are in the headlines everywhere, on the radio, special TV reports. Attitudes and expectations are changing rapidly. Let me just ask, are you more worried about athletes in Fairbanks with concussions? More worried than you were five years ago? I sure am. Um, well, a healthy dose of worry is a good thing, but let's see what we can do about it together. A review of all football head injuries resulting in permanent brain damage between 1989 and 2002 showed that 98% of those occurred in high school. 59% had a history of previous concussion, usually in the same season. And 39% were still symptomatic from their last concussion when the catastrophic injury occurred. Over the last 55 years, the overwhelming majority of football brain injury deaths, 91%, were in younger athletes, high school age, 10 times the deaths in college and pros combined. So death and disability from athletic brain injury is predominantly a problem of young brains. And I would have to conclude from the data I just shared with you that we were not doing a very good job of protecting our athletes. The truth is that we still do not know the best way to treat youth sports concussion. But we have learned that there was no scientific validity to the way we used to do it, sending athletes back to play as soon as symptoms cleared. Our previous thinking and protocols led to unacceptable deaths and disability. And so internationally, medical organizations have come together with a consensus of a more conservative approach. While the consensus and the standards are clear, we really do not know if this is too liberal or if it's too conservative. It may well change, but as parents, coaches, and healthcare providers, the best that we can do right now is to follow the recommended standards, obey the law, and comply with statewide school policies. That's on all of us. Follow the law, comply with the school policies. Concussions are not only some other school district. I see six to eight concussions every football weekend in Fairbanks, and there are a lot more, the ones that the athletes don't tell me about. One of our lady basketball players had a concussion in practice. She was unconscious for 20 minutes. Four months later, she was still having symptoms. She never returned to play. She dropped out of school. One of our 14-year-old lady hockey players had three concussions in three weeks. Only when she lost vision due to bleeding in her brain was she removed from practice and games. It took six months before she could skate without headaches and nausea. She still has permanent loss of vision. So a ding is not just a ding. He didn't just get rocked. Those are all concussions. And it doesn't just happen in football. It happens in all sports. Not just young men, but even more in women, and especially in teenagers. The CDC says 5.5 million sports concussions occur in the U.S. each year. In a way, that's a reassuring number, because most of these concussions get better and get better quickly but there's a subgroup that don't get better. This will be my 35th year as a physician on the sidelines at football games. And any of you who's been the parent or the coach of a high school athlete for even a few years can recall the athletes who struggled to recover from their concussions. That's what we're all about today and every day, working together to try to make sure that bad things don't happen. A concussion is a change in brain function following injury from a force transmitted to the brain by a blow to the head or to the body. Concussions change the physiology, the working of the brain, but not the gross structure. So traditional CT and MRI imaging are normal. The symptoms reflect which part or pathway of the brain is injured and not working normally. 
That's why concussions are not all the same and why management needs to be individualized. There's a wide range of symptoms involving thinking, body function, emotions, and sleep. Thinking, body function, emotions, and sleep. It's unusual for a concussion to result in loss of consciousness. In fact, in a very recent study of US high schools, only 4% of concussions produced loss of consciousness. There goes the excuse I hear so often, but doc, I couldn't have had a concussion. Um, I didn't lose consciousness. I wasn't knocked out. And check out the mouth guard preventing the concussion. That's another myth. Frequently, the athlete has a headache. In fact, it's the most common symptom. Often, it's the only symptom. Sometimes the athlete's dizzy, sometimes confused. Sometimes they seem detached, not all there. Um, they say that they feel like they're in a fog or underwater. Sometimes they're nauseous or have blurred or double vision. Photophobia or phonophobia, irritated by or intolerant of light or noise. Sometimes there's retrograde amnesia, not remembering events that occurred before the concussion. And sometimes antigrade amnesia, not remembering events that occurred after the concussion. Sometimes there's a change in personality, laughing, crying, swearing, combative, depressive, reclusive. You need to know the athlete to know if he or she is themselves. And I rely so much on the coach, the athletic trainer, the parent to tell me this. Sometimes it's subtle. They just can't follow the game. They miss assignments. They don't anticipate the way that they usually would. If the athlete is not acting like himself or herself after taking a blow, then they have a concussion. The measure of the severity of the concussion is the number and the severity of the symptoms. The number and severity of the symptoms. The brain needs time to recover. We don't know any way to speed it up. It doesn't help to ice your head. And the brain recovers even more slowly if you're younger. While it's healing, the injured brain is more vulnerable to injury by another blow, especially another blow to a young brain. So the youth athlete's brain is more vulnerable to concussion, more vulnerable to additional injury, and takes longer to heal. We do know that there are risk factors which predispose to both getting a concussion and to having a more prolonged recovery from that concussion. Younger athletes are at more risk than older athletes for concussion and for long-lasting concussions. The proportion of all injuries represented by concussion is more than three times as great in high school as it is in college. Migraines, or even a family history of migraines, increases the risk of concussion and prolongs the recovery from concussion. Learning disabilities such as dyslexias, Attention disorders such as ADD and ADHD, psychiatric illnesses such as depression and anxiety, seizure disorders and sleep disorders, they each increase the risk of and prolong the recovery from concussion. Moreover, the symptoms of these problems and the symptoms of concussion overlap greatly, and concussion tends to exacerbate the underlying condition which makes the interpretation and the management of the symptoms very challenging. 11 to 20% of high school concussions occur in athletes who've had a previous concussion. Previous concussion increases the risk of additional and more severe concussion. After one concussion, there's a 50% greater risk of a second concussion. If there were three concussions in the last five years, there is a three times greater risk of a fourth concussion. It takes longer to recover from recurrent concussions. Female athletes sustain more concussions and they take longer to recover. The risk of concussion varies by sport. An athlete exposure is one athlete going to one practice or game. What sport has the highest risk of concussion in high school? Football. But the 2013 high school data shows that hockey is not far behind. And look at girls' soccer. It ranks fourth. 
In fact, in every high school sport where both sexes play, the concussion rate is higher for women. As you can see, a lot higher. How do we know when an athlete has recovered from concussion? That could be really important, eh? Well, how could you measure recovery? You might follow the symptoms. You might do neurocognitive testing, or you might do what's called a functional MRI. The NFHS Injury Surveillance Study looked at the time required for symptoms of concussion to resolve. They focused in particular on the percent of concussions that required more than three weeks for symptoms to resolve. Depending upon the sport, anywhere from 2 to 12 percent of concussions last more than three weeks. Three weeks is forever to an athlete. Heck, it's practically half of our football season in Alaska. But these are student athletes. That is also three weeks missed from history and calculus and AP biology. And when you're behind in your sport, behind in school, failing your classes, taken away from your friends, it naturally leads to anxiety and depression. Acute psychiatric symptoms are miserable in themselves, but they also further prolong the concussion recovery. So prolonged recovery from concussion has implications beyond sport. Even more significant are the academic and social consequences and the mental health consequences. Another way to measure recovery is neurocognitive testing, computer testing of memory and reaction time. Impact is the most popular test. In a three-year football study, baseline testing was done before the season. After concussion occurred, impact testing was repeated until performance returned to the baseline level. 20% of concussed football players required more than three weeks to recover. So recovery by impact testing takes longer than recovery defined simply as the resolution of symptoms. A third way of measuring recovery is functional MRI. Functional MRI measures the location and intensity of brain activity when the brain is performing a task, such as reading or calculating. When returned to normal FMR, sorry, functional MRI activation patterns is used to measure recovery from concussion, then the time required is much longer than when symptoms or impact testing were used to define recovery. 60% of all athletes required more than three weeks to recover. Even at three months, 10% of high school athletes were still not recovered from their concussion. It makes you appreciate how abnormal the high school athlete's brain still is when they seem normal and when we are putting them back in harm's way. And you should hear the abuse doctors take for holding an athlete out for one week. In conclusion, the time to recovery depends on what test of recovery you choose. The problem is that we do not know where the threshold of safety is, but we do know that our return to play protocol works well to safely return the concussed athlete. Teammates, coaches, parents, you're on the front door of the team effort to protect concussed athletes. Your job is this recognize these signs and symptoms. When you see these things or when the athlete reports these things, that's enough. Hold them out of practice or play until they can be evaluated. It's the right thing to do. It's the law. And you may have saved a life or saved a long-term disability. In all head and neck injuries, we assume a catastrophic neck injury is present until proven otherwise. This is especially true in the unconscious athlete. We protect the cervical spine, assess the airway, breathing, and circulation. To rule out spinal injury, we must establish that there's no spinal pain, no spinal tenderness, a normal neurologic exam in all four extremities. If the athlete is unconscious or if they're suspected to have a spinal injury, then we complete the spinal stabilization and transport them. You've no doubt seen us do this. If the athlete is conscious and has no spine injury, then examination can continue on the sidelines. 
The sideline evaluation of the concussed athlete includes a neurologic exam and what we call the SCAT-3 exam. The SCAT-3 consists of a screen for symptoms, a mental status exam, and a balance exam. That's the SCAT-3. A basic neurologic exam is performed. We look for those symptoms of concussion. Remember, cognitive, somatic, affective, and sleep. In the mental status exam, we ask questions that evaluate orientation and short and long-term memory. And Dr. Bruner is going to do an excellent job of explaining that kind of questioning and exam, the mental status exam, the SCAT-3. We rate balance by evaluating postural stability in three different positions. The concussed athlete should be closely monitored for several hours. Do not abandon the concussed athlete. Deterioration in symptoms and examination, if it's going to occur, do so in the first few hours. And when that happens, it suggests a more serious injury, more serious than concussion, such as a skull fracture or cerebral edema or bleeding within the head. If the concussed athlete is deteriorating, then an emergent CT scan is performed. Fortunately, the athlete usually does well in those first few hours and is sent home. In accordance with the law, the parents and the athletes are given a copy of the parent's guide to concussion and the CDC athlete fact sheet, and those are available for you this evening. <laughs> the parent's guide contains the OSA return to play protocol, and all of these and other useful information are available on the OSA website. ASAA.org. After concussion, the athlete should rest. Physical and mental activity will make the symptoms worse. In the beginning, minimal physical activity and minimal mental activity. No driving. It's critical that the athlete be referred to a qualified health care provider, qualified and trained under the law, who will supervise the return to play protocol. Here's what athletes should expect from their health care provider. They need to find out about previous concussions and about the risk factors that we've discussed. Remember, youth, female gender, learning, attention, sleep, seizure, migraine, psychiatric disorders. Because if there have been previous concussions or if some of those risk factors are present, then the concussion is going to last longer and the athlete is more likely to have another concussion and that concussion is likely to be even worse, in which case the return to academics and the return to play protocols should be slowed down. The neuro exam and the SCAT-3 are repeated to assess the severity of the concussion. Remember, that's the number and severity of the symptoms and the status of resolution of those symptoms. The symptoms change daily, so the provider needs to be asking about them daily and the return to academics and return to play decisions need to be based on the progression of the signs and the symptoms over time. It's not cookbook. Two athletes respond differently. One athlete will respond differently to the first concussion than to their second concussion. The return decisions need to be individualized. So the provider can't say, coach, he has a concussion, he'll be out for seven days, because no one knows what's going to happen over the next seven days. All you can say is that, at a minimum, it'll be seven days. So let's talk about those return protocols. The athlete may seem normal at the resting level, but you don't know how well the brain will recover until you stress it. And so you stress it with cognitive work first, and then you stress it with physical work. The progression should be incremental and cautious, so that if symptoms do reappear, they will be mild, and the resulting distress for the concussed brain will be mild. If there are no symptoms, then the athlete can return to a trial of normal school, homework, and testing all at once. No symptoms, return to everything at school all at once. But if symptoms persist, it's more reasonable to initiate an incremental return to school so long as symptoms are not made worse by going to school. The length of the school day is increased incrementally, 
homework, and return to testing are added incrementally. If symptoms recur or are made worse by going to school, then drop back to a cognitive level at which the symptoms are tolerable and not made worse by going to school. In contrast to academics, there is no physical activity until symptom-free for 24 hours. No return to physical activity until symptom-free for 24 hours. And that symptom-free is determined by the health care provider, not the father, not the coach. Then aerobic activity is introduced and its intensity is increased incrementally. When moderately heavy aerobic exercise is tolerated, then resistance exercises, weightlifting, are added. Physical education begins on day two and progresses, remaining at the previous day's activity level. So when the athlete's on day four of the progression, the physical education activities are on day three. I think it's confusing to call these days because it doesn't necessarily follow day one, day two. You may be at day one for, for several days before you're ready to progress to day two. Um, and so I prefer to think of it as uh, stages instead of days. Um, and, and I hope that we'll get permission to change that so it'll be less confusing to all of us as time goes on. There, there should be at least 24 hours between stages. There should be more time between stages when those modifying factors that we talked about are present. Second concussion, I double the time between stages. If exercise provokes symptoms, then exercise is discontinued. And when the symptoms um, have resolved for 24 hours, then exercise begins again at the previous stage. Resistance training is added last as it really increases the blood pressure, the intracranial pressure, the pressure on the concussed brain. A qualified and trained healthcare professional clears the athlete in writing before beginning the return to play protocol and the provider, parent, and athlete all sign a form at the completion of the return to play protocol before the athlete returns to competition. This is the international standard because it's the right thing to do. And it's the law in Alaska and now all the states. In fact, it's the same protocol that's followed by our military when concussions are sustained in battle. Efficient use of health care provider time and financial savings for the athlete and their family is made possible by what we might call a care extender. In Fairbanks, we're particularly uh, reliant upon certified athletic trainers and school nurses for this purpose. The care extender can obtain a daily symptom review, do the mental status exam, do a neuro exam, and then a decision can be made together with the physician about whether or not to progress the return to play protocol. Good communication is critical between the physician and the care extender. But it's also critical that each school identify a concussion coordinator on their staff. It becomes the coordinator's responsibility to quickly disseminate the daily decision of the health care team to all of those who need to know at the school. The athletic director, the coach, the school nurse, the counselor, the athletic trainer, each of the teachers, the PE teacher, everybody needs to know and be on the same page every day only happens if the school has a concussion coordinator. So in conclusion, remember to take them out. If there's any suspicion of concussion, don't leave them alone because the concussion can get worse. This is a medical issue, not for parents or coaches to decide. Concussed athletes need a qualified and trained healthcare provider. Return to school and play is by law a medically supervised progression. Safety demands complete recovery from symptoms and tolerance of high levels of cognitive work and exercise before return to normal athletic activity. It's the right thing to do. It's the law. We're so fortunate in Fairbanks to, to have the athletic trainers that we do. Um, and uh, for 30 years, I guess, we've had athletic trainers in Fairbanks. We're the only school district in the state like that. 
So I wanted to introduce them to you. This is Jeremy Lindgren. He's the athletic trainer at North Pole High School. Christine is with us tonight. He's the athletic trainer at West Valley and the senior athletic trainer in the school district. <clears throat> He's also a member of the uh, National Athletic Trainers Association Secondary Schools Committee who takes care of um, the uh, high schools throughout the country uh, and is the president of the Alaska Athletic Trainers Association. Anthony Irby is the athletic trainer at Eielson High School. David Boyd is the athletic trainer at Lathrop. Chris Brockman is the athletic trainer at Monroe. Um, and now I'm uh, delighted to reintroduce to you Laura Bruner, pediatrician at Tanana Valley Clinic. Uh, Dr. Bruner and uh, Dr. Westfall have been a tremendous help to me in the education of Fairbanks physicians about concussions. Um, and I thank you for that. Dr. Bruner is going to talk about what you can expect when you take your son or daughter to see the family physician or the pediatrician and, uh, and get help with their concussion. Would you like this or would you sure. like the handheld? It doesn't matter. I can do that. Sorry, Garrett. I'll give you that too. Okay. Can you guys hear me okay? So I'm Laura Bruner. I'm one of the pediatricians at the Tanner Valley Clinic, and I'm just going to talk briefly about if you bring your child in to see us and you're concerned that your kid has a concussion, what we would do to help figure that out. Excuse me, doctor. Yes. Uh, I think it's too bad. I'm why don't you take the handheld, okay. if that's all right? Sure. And then we'll see if we can figure out what's going on. Is that okay? That. Yeah. Okay. So I think the main thing to sort of touch on with a concussion is people say, well, how do I know I have a concussion? And it's that we don't really have a perfect test. So you can't come in and get your strep test to tell if you had a concussion. That we don't have a blood test. We don't have an x-ray test to say, yep. I will look closer. Is that better? So we don't have a perfect test to tell that there's a concussion. So we don't have a strep test or a blood test or an x-ray test to tell you, yes, that you do have a concussion. That, as Dr. Keller mentioned, the diagnosis is based on history, physical exam, and then aided by a tool. That the standardized tools that we use to the, are uh, questions and exams uh, about memory, test of your cognitive ability or your thinking ability, and then we can compare those tests over time. And as Dr. Keller mentioned, they're administered by a concussion care provider under the Alaska state law. This is, you can't read it, but this is an example of the SCAT 2. We now use a SCAT 3, and it goes through all the different steps of what you do to administer that test. So the first part is a history. So when you come in to see the doctor, we usually say something like, why are you here? And that's how the, the exam of a concussion starts. So what happened? Where were you when you got hit? What did you feel like afterwards? What did you hit? What did other people see around there? So it's just a history of tell me what happened. So some of the questions that we ask are about symptoms. So do you have a headache? Is there pressure in your head? Neck pain? Nausea, dizziness, blurred vision? You guys feeling concussed yet? Balance problems, sensitivity to light, sensitivity to noise, feeling slowed down, difficulty concentrating, feeling like you're in a fog, just feeling not like yourself. Kids will oftentimes come in and say, I got hit a couple days ago and I just haven't been quite right since then. Difficulty remembering, drowsiness, Trouble falling asleep, trouble staying asleep, more emotional. Sadness. So the next part is a cognitive assessment. So these are basic questions that most people should be able to answer if they are not concussed. So what day is it? What time of day is it? What day of the, what day of the week? What year? Um, we go through a couple of different pieces in the cognitive assessment as well. So if you brought your kid in to see me for a concussion, I would say, what month is it? What day is it today? What day of the week? What year is it? What time is it right now? And then I would say I'm going to test your memory. So you guys get to play along here. 
We're going to test your memory. I'm going to read you a list of words and then see if you can repeat them back to me. So, elbow, apple, carpet, saddle, bubble. So the most of you do not have a concussion. <laughs> and then we say, I'm going to read a string of words to you, and I'd like you to read them backwards to me. So if I say 719, you would say 917. 493. So close. <laughs> so next, the, now it gets harder. The string gets longer. So 3814. Yeah, it's not easy. You guys might be concussed. <laughs> Six, two, nine, seven, one. You guys feel sorry for the high school kids now, don't you? Seven, one, eight, four, six, two. Now everybody just laughs. Okay. So then the next part of the cognitive assessment is tell me the months backwards. So start with December and work your way backwards. Fabulous. And you can see it took a minute to process that, and that's what we're trying to prompt people to do, is start one place and work to the other, and then see if they have the attention and focus to be able to do that. So the next part is the balance exam, and there's a couple uh, different things that we look at with the balance exam. So if you came to see us, these are my nurses that we were checking for concussions. Um, that we look at. So we have you stand in three different positions. So Chris, do you mind demonstrating? We'll see if you're concussed as well. So stand legs together, hands on hips, and then we won't make Chris do it, but we would ask you to close your eyes for 20 seconds and see how you do. So if you are not concussed, you should be able to hold relatively in that position. You will see concussed athletes all over the place with this. So then next is single leg stance, so it's your non-dominant leg, so the opposite leg that you would kick a ball with. So if you kick with your right leg, you stand on the opposite leg. There you go. Um, and then heel to toe. So same thing, we're just seeing how is your brain controlling your balance and your movement. And then the next part uh, is a neurologic exam. So I love this picture because people think it's just a cute cat. But if you look at this, this cat's eyes, their pupils are very different sizes. So that would be a big concern on a neurologic exam. So when you come in to see the doctor, they check your reflexes. Um, in kids, we have them do finger, nose, finger. So touch your finger and touch my finger back and forth. But we're looking at how those nerves in your brain are controlling your muscles and the rest of your brain. So again, diagnosis of a concussion is really a score based on a standardized tool that can be followed over time and looked at over time, following the return to play protocol like Dr. Keller said, and then the steps are set out by the state law, by ASA, and we really rely on the help of school nurses, athletic trainers, and medical providers to help implement this return to play. So you may come to see us in the clinic and we may say, yes, you have a concussion. I would like to call your school nurse and see if she can help us over the next week plan those steps back so you don't have to come to the doctor every single day or every single step along that return to play protocol to come back. And I will let Chris say a few things here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Bruner. Uh, my name is Christopher Dean. I'm an athletic trainer in Fairbanks. I've, uh, I've worked as sports medicine in Fairbanks for my night. This is my 19th year. I worked full-time in the school district for 13 years as an athletic trainer taking care of the high school kids. Dr. Keller asked me to come and speak about the role that athletic trainers can uh, take to assist family practitioners or pediatricians in the care of concussed athletes. Um, as you've heard from Dr. Keller and Dr. Bruner, both following a concussion, there's a regimented stage uh, return to participation process that each athlete must follow. So um, it's oftentimes very difficult to get in to see the pediatrician for one visit, let alone seven straight visits. Uh, and that's where the athletic trainers and the school nurses can help the uh, physicians um, and, the, and the students and their parents. Uh, it's an it's a easy process for us. We are at the schools. Uh, students are typically at the schools as well, especially when they're healthy and working toward getting back into participation. Um, 
I'm not sure if there's any specific questions tonight, but I'd be happy to answer any specific questions after we're done. But as a resource, uh, the athletic trainers, each school in Fairbanks has an athletic trainer, and we're happy to help um, with the primary care provider return the athlete to full participation safely. So thank you for the opportunity to come and speak tonight, and I'll pass it over to Jennifer and let her talk about school nurses. Hi, I'm Jennifer Glorioso. I'm the Director of Nursing Services for the school district, and I'm just I'm going to address the role that school nurses play in our um, athletes and students with concussions. And I, I also want to, um, I don't know, um, say how lucky we are in Fairbanks that we have athletic trainers in every high school and in all the, the schools except for the charter schools, we have a school nurse. So we're very, very fortunate. If a, when a child or a student, um, when a student or an athlete has a concussion, they um, report to the school nurse or to the athletic trainer, and we have a, like Dr. Bruner and Dr. Keller mentioned, we have a, a, a regimented plan that we take take them through, and it's it, it's they can't complete it, like Dr. Keller mentioned, you can't just say it's seven days they're done. It, some it, it varies between student. First of all, they have to they have to be ready academically. Dr. Keller mentioned that we we start stressing the brain a little bit to, to see what it to, to see where we are. So first of all, academically, we want to want to bring them back slowly. So the first day they might only be at school for half a day. The second day they might be at school for um, most of the day but they would have reduced activities and as long as they were having symptoms. And we also have a process in, in place, and Dr. Keller mentioned a concussion care coordinator. Every school, elementary, middle, high school, has guidance counselors and they serve this role. So the school nurse would report to the guidance counselor, uh, little Johnny is still having trouble, he's reporting headaches, he's still not able to tolerate a full day of academics or you know, mental capacity. So as soon as they are fully able to tolerate back to school acti uh, academic activity, then they can go on to incremental increase in their physical activity. And as Dr. Keller mentioned, it, it, it is in stages. And the first day, they might have 15 minutes of aerobic activity, and that progresses as tolerated. And when they, if they hit a stage where they have more symptoms, the complaining of, of headaches, then they stop, stay at that stage for at least 24 hours, and then we progress them on. After they have completed all the stages and they're back to full physical activity, there is still one more step. We need to confer again with the physician and make sure that everybody's in agreement that this student or athlete can indeed return to full participation. So that's basically it in a nutshell. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Dr. Bruner and Chris um, and Jennifer. I really appreciate you taking the time to, to share your um, good information with us, and I'm glad to have the help of the trainers and the school nurses in the school district. Um, I know uh, some of you have other things to do tonight, and if you feel like leaving, this is a good time to leave, so no embarrassment. Um, but what we're going to do uh, from this point on is to uh, present you some uh, case studies and um, be a good opportunity to, uh, to uh, uh, try to be doctors and follow what you've learned about taking care of concussions and uh, what you know about the law. Um, and a good opportunity to answer questions that come up in kind of real life uh, situations. Um, so let's do that. Um, here's uh, case study number one, a 14 year old female hockey player with a history of migraines goes to see her family practitioner. She hit the boards head first five days ago. She couldn't go to school for two days because of her headache and blurred vision, and those came back whenever she tried to read or to use the computer. She still gets headaches when she studies, but she is managing a full day of school now and doing a full homework load. Since she's back in school 
and has a game in three days, she wants to begin the return to play protocol and she figures she's on day five. Is she on day five? No. No, why not? She had two days of headaches. She hasn't been sent in days 24 hours. Right, she's still having symptoms. She's back there at stage zero. Oh, does that make sense to you guys? Yeah. Well, we sure, sure get them trying to yank our chain like that all the time. Um, should she begin the return to play protocol at this point? No. Still having symptoms. Okay. Um, can she play in the game in three days, Chris? Absolutely not. No way. Um, does this girl have some risk factors? Yes. What are they? Migraines, she's a girl, and she's 14, yeah. So um, if anything, we might go slowly and not try to push her ahead in this return to play process. Good, you guys are uh, halfway to, to your diploma. Can I ask a question? When you're saying return to play, does that mean that this girl shouldn't be doing any exercise or activity at all? Like, any exercise? Yeah. Not, I'm not talking about she doesn't return to the game, but what should she be doing? I mean, that's another question maybe at the end. Mm -hmm. Sorry. For but someone who's still having symptoms? Yeah. Like this girl? <clears throat> then, then we're not going out of our way for extra activity. Um, you know, obviously you have to walk around the house, you have to walk through school if you're going to go back to school even when you have symptoms. So we can't reduce the physical activity to zero. But we're not doing anything extra because she's not tolerating um, cognitive work without symptoms. So we're not ready to stress her with extra exercise. Okay. Um, any thoughts from you guys on that? Sums up pretty well. Okay. Uh, here's a 15 year old football player. He says he got his bell rung five days ago in football practice. Because his headache persisted, he was seen by his primary care provider at Bassett Army Hospital and given two medicines, uh, Topamax and Vicodin. Um, Topamax is a seizure medicine that's often helpful uh, with headaches after concussion. Vicodin, as you know, is a moderately powerful uh, narcotic medicine. Um, he's taken the medications faithfully for the last five days and he's still taking them. And his headache is gone. Um, and he has no other symptoms. Uh, it's been 10 days now since his concussion, and he gives a note to his coach that's written on a prescription form uh, by the Army doctor that uh, says he's cleared to play. Um, so let's see, uh, is he symptom-free, uh, Chris? It's, it's not possible to tell if he's symptom-free because of the medicines masking what potentially could be symptoms. Right. Um, so you got to be symptom free off of all your medication, not with the medication. Um, has he met the legal requirements uh, to be cleared to play, Dr. Bruner? No way. Um, Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. I'd think that they'd be free of the narcotics, certainly in 48 hours. Um, and I don't know the half-life of Topamax and how long that takes. Do you know that? It, it's probably similar. Um, and we'd rather take meds and $20 Good question. I don't, I don't know exactly. Yeah. Um, Right, right. How long do you have to wait? 25 hours, halfway. Oh, there you go. Uh, so, so to really be truly out of your system might want to wait three, four days, and, or you could really argue it was gone. Uh, but it works best when it's uh, when it's at its therapeutic level. So even falling below therapeutic level would probably be adequate. Oh, okay. yeah. But yeah, we're talking days off of medicine anyway. Um, yes? Um, what about the doctor writing the note? Then who 
overrules the medical person. So so the school nurse overrules the doctor or You know, you are clairvoyant, because I had that right here to ask that question. Yeah. Um, and you can imagine that comes up. Um, uh, so uh, the sort of scenario might be um, the nurse or the athletic trainer, you know, someone, uh, the coach maybe, um, receives the note and they go, hey, you know, this is not an OSA form. This doesn't have all the things on the OSA form it's supposed to. This note is meaningless. You uh, you can't play, and and then the dad goes berserk, you know, <laughs> and and then the dad who happens to be an attorney says, um, who do you think you are, you athletic trainer or school nurse, overruling the doctor? You can't do that. That's illegal, um, and this really happens, you know, um, and it really increases the perspiration level of everyone in the room, um, and. Uh, Chris, what's, you know, you've been doing this so many years, uh, and I know you've been in that situation more than once. So what's your attitude toward people telling you that you're inferior to a doctor and that you can't overrule them? You know, ironically, uh, that very situation happened today. Oh, is that right? It, yes. Um, I had a, a concussed athlete who brought me a note. Uh, concussed athlete from this weekend who brought a note in. Um, he actually hit the concussion through the weekend because he didn't want to stop playing football. And uh, symptomatic enough today that he finally decided that something wasn't right. And so he went to the doctor and brought a note in saying that uh, he could participate with some modification while he had symptoms. And as soon as the symptoms were resolved, he could return to full participation. And he needed no follow up. Um, so, you know, as our caller said, you know, it happens at least once a year uh, in the high school. Um, you know, there are often tense conversations, um, but the law is the law, and uh, we follow what the law says, and ultimately we're doing what's right for the kid. Uh, just because somebody else makes a decision not to follow the law and take a risk, uh, we're not going to do that. Any thoughts from you guys on that? It, well, it's the same. I mean, it's the, it's, it's the state law, so we have no choice. And, and we've had this come up a couple times in middle school children, and we, we worked it out. The doctor wasn't aware, we changed proper forms, but um, it's the law. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I've more than once made a phone call to a physician and um, explained to them I'm there to help and um, remind them about the law and that it seems like maybe the law is being broken and. Um, here would be the right way of doing things, and boy, usually people are right in line with doing it the right way once once you explain to them what the right way is. I think it's mostly out of ignorance, and uh, I'm ashamed that despite all my efforts for many years that, that there's still plenty of folks uh, in the medical profession who are confused about this, much less uh, the public. Um, but so many physicians... Um, uh, and Dr. Bruner's a good example. Um, Dr. Westfall is another good example. Working hard to try to make sure that the medical community rises to the standard that we want to be at. And it's getting better all the time. And things like this help us all, and they help you too. Um, they help you know what to expect and to make sure it happens right um, for your injured athletes. Um, uh, sometimes I'm asked, why did we have to have this law in the first place? I mean, shouldn't people just be doing the right thing? Why do you need a law? Um, and fully agree, uh, but situations like uh, you know the the dad who's irritated about this scenario, um, it really helps me to say, I'm sorry, it's the law, sir. You know, and uh, just because somebody else is about to break the law, doesn't mean I'm going with it. And I'm here to represent the school district, and the school district isn't going to break the law. Um, we're just going to have to do this the right way. You know? I don't care if you are an attorney. Randy, were you going to ask something? Uh, I think you got an answer. In the beginning, I heard you say that this was the law, and now we've got a doctor violating the law, but I think you now have answered it. Kids, yeah, there's probably a general. <laughs> <laughs> I think there was a question. Do military doctors 
Military doctors have to abide by the state law too? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Um, um, mm, yeah, but, uh, but civilian and military doctors alike, we're, we're all trying to learn to do a better job of this. Yeah. Yes? If, if students are required to rest or stay for a week because of concussion, what provision is made for tutoring them, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, they just um, uh, they just need to rest from the cognitive activity to the extent that trying to do the cognitive activity is making their symptoms worse. So, um, so they might be able to go to school and tolerate the schoolwork even though they were still having some symptoms. Um, but that's a really good question. If they can't do their normal schoolwork, if they aren't at a point where they're capable of taking tests and um, if the SAT is next weekend, you know, then presents some real problems. Um, and uh, uh, Jennifer, maybe you can tell us about how the school makes reasonable accommodations for people like that. Um, academically, we will work out a plan, and that's why we developed this new system of having a, what we call a um, concussion care coordinator and care of the guidance counselor. So the student will never be penalized academically for having a, a concussion and taking the proper steps and coming back. So I believe um, it was mentioned before what would happen with a, a female athlete and she missed a lot of school. She wouldn't be penalized. She would not be flunking her classes. We would make accommodations, um, change them if we had the, not me, but the teachers in conjunction with the guidance counselor, would change the, the way they had to test her. Um, they, they would get the opportunity to, to make up what they what they lost. So I think that was kind of what you were actually asking. Would they be punished or do they get the chance to to uh, um, make up what, what they were missing? Okay. <clears throat> we're gearing this towards the, um, the, the concussed athlete. There's also another subgroup that we see, which is just the concussed person, child. And are you wanting from the school district to also get them um, in touch with the school and to follow them with that. Not because they want to return to play, but they want to return to thinking. But that's what we do, generally. And generally, they, they, they go to the doctor because we can't send them back to PE if we know that they, they had a concussion. And, uh, you know, community at large, please, if your child has had a concussion, please communicate that with, with the school nurse. Sometimes, just like with, with some athletes, when we find out like a week later. So you're talking from elementary all the way up. If your kid is five and in kindergarten has this, whether they're there to up to um, a senior. We communicate with their doctor and follow their doctor and take it, yeah, very, very slow so that we can get them back and, and pee. But if we had a, a for example, a, a first grader who, who suffered a concussion and they were having problems um, cognitively returning to their academic studies, that they would, would have um, accommodations made for them. So you're not allowing them to return to play, but if they want to advance faster academically, like we have, you know, the first half day, and, then more, and they want to be there more, do you not allow them to? Oh, uh, uh, yes, certainly. So academically, as, as long as they're tolerating it. So maybe I'm not understanding your question. But I'm saying, so we don't, we, we don't let them return to play, um, and we have a protocol that you do day one, the half day, the full day. If a family has decided their child, no, he's ready for a full day on their own, are you letting them as a school district go more towards more academic, staying there the full day when really the protocol says you're only supposed to be here a half day? Do you keep them out or are they allowed to stay? Um, if, if it, well, we assess the child and if the child has symptoms, then we, we call the parent and if, if they're really having issues like a headache or confusion, we have to send them home. But I'm, I'm not sure I'm really at Okay. So it's a question. Yeah, so Go ahead. That yeah. was kind of what John Keller was looking at, the separate return to academics versus return to play. So return to play is those set steps on there. And return to academics, they can go back to full academics if they're symptom-free initially. So they can go back to school. They may not be able to go back to PE class for the full 30 minutes. That may be a slower return for a kindergartner. But if they're symptom-free for academics, they can go back to that fast. So nobody's interested in slowing down a kid from going back to school and doing normal schoolwork? 
and the only reason to slow them down would be if doing the cognitive work makes their symptoms worse to the extent that, that they have trouble tolerating that. You know? The law said that um, that ASA had to work together with the school districts to develop the details of the uh, return to play protocol, and that's the return to play protocol that ASA developed and that the school districts need to follow. Um, when we developed that protocol, um, it was our recommendation to ASA that it say stages instead of days, because we imagined the confusion that might come from that. Um, and for reasons I don't recall, uh, the, uh, uh, the board of directors of ASA uh, thought it would be more clear to people if it were days. I think it was to try to emphasize that there had to be at least 24 hours between the stages, you know. Yeah. So you've, I think you've got some problems of misinterpretation either way. I'd, I'd rather it said stages. Uh, I intend to go back to the board and say, you know, we've tried this for a while. I think it ought to say stages. Well, I think um, I, I really like your, mm -hmm. your questions because, you know, there's a lot of people who might, there's a lot of students who might have suffered a concussion another way, and they're not looking to go back to play. You know, they're looking to go back to school or to exercise or to PE. So I'm just, you know, it's just an interesting, you know, so then those students, you know, the parents and everyone else has to sort of extrapolate, okay, well, they're not going back to play, but can they go, like, if the school is walking for rocket day, you know what I mean, are they allowed to walk more than 15 minutes to get to the rocket day? Do you, do you see what I mean? They're not, day one is, no, day zero, you know, you can only go to zero if you have concussive symptoms, but day one, is like 15 minutes of light exercise or something like that. And then if they're not trying to go back to the, to the school, then there's a, you know, you have to say, okay, can they go to a field trip? Because really it's not day one, it's stage one. Like, like they're saying here, some students are concussive, especially in the young brain, like for maybe a year. I mean, sometimes if you still have symptoms for months and months and months, then the teachers are confused, well, they can't go to Rocket Day, for example, over in that field because they're not at stage one yet because they haven't been without symptoms for 24 hours. So this involves 15 minutes of walking, so they can't go there. Does that make sense? I mean, that's what I'm saying. It would be really nice if the law would also include something not just to return to play, but return to the school day. The school <laughs> you know? district uh, passed an administrative regulation that mirrors the ASA return to participation, and every student in the school district from K through 12 who has a concussion has to go through that. It's an administrative regulation. It's the exact same process. Return to participation. Yes. Okay. So both return to academics and return to physical activity, it mirrors the OSA policy. Oh, terrific. Thank you. Yeah. So there is an administrative regulation in place already. Um, and that's what... <laughs> it's it's very long and detailed. I can tell you that. I accept the committee's for that. Okay. 
Return to participation and return to what? Academics. Academics. Randy? Along those lines, we did go talk about checks and balances with doctors and some physicians they come back and parents want to get them in. Are, are all parents of, of athletes in high school supplied with a hard copy of the law so they know they are good? Yeah, at the beginning of the season, they're actually given the, the parent's guide. Um, and uh, um, uh, and I think the problem is that you don't take that too seriously until your child is concussed. Uh, and then you don't remember where you put it. And so um, so the also rule is that when an athlete is concussed, then you give them another copy and discuss it with them. You know, then, then they're likely to listen and take it seriously. Uh, um, and uh, uh, yeah, school districts throughout the state are just as interested in taking care of the non-athlete who's concussed. I think that our, our efforts to think about concussions in athletes have made everybody think about uh, what we do to take care of concussions in young persons who aren't athletes. Um, and that at a minimum, we ought to follow the same sort of protocols. And maybe for five-year-olds, it ought to be even different. It's just out of ignorance that we don't know any better whether it should be different or how. But at a minimum, we ought to do what we're doing uh, in the protocols we've talked about. Uh, and, uh, and one of the big issues is you got to tell us if you're concussed. <clears throat> if you're an athlete, we have a lot of ways of finding out pretty fast. But if you're not, you, you really can you know pass under the wire without anyone telling. It's also changed how we address adults who have had a concussion, not athletic, but now are struggling to get back to work. Um, if have patients who fall asleep, hit their head on the ice and they can't function at work, how much computer time is okay? How much so the law was directed at the kids and participating in high school sports brought awareness to a thirty-five year old person who slipped yeah, I appreciate that comment. It's really true. May I just add, in the physical therapist in the community, I've worked with the type of person and a few other people with concussions, only one young athlete, and all were many months after their concussion, were not symptom free. And addressing the soft tissue damage, musculature, fascia, that may be restricting circulation as a result of car accident type things. And cranial uh, sacral therapy also seems to contribute to improved circulation, improved healing. I mean, obviously, people are all individual, and I don't know if um, their overall improvement is a result of the therapy or just it's they're on track finally to get better. But I have seen uh, uh, slow improvement. It may uh, shorten the time frame. Again, these are people that with really long term. I think when people don't get better, you know, several weeks have passed and symptoms are persisting, that you're, you're beginning to define yourself as that subgroup of people who have persistent symptoms and aren't getting better. And that uh, when that happens, uh, that we all shouldn't just wait and hope it'll eventually get better, but you start to think about reevaluating <clears throat> reevaluating the person um, on a number of different levels um, and calling in additional levels of expertise. Um, and we really uh, uh, have uh, uh, come to greatly admire the work that the University of Washington's uh, uh, Sports Concussion Center does. They're a tremendous resource for us and people who aren't getting better. Um, I said before we don't know of any way to make concussions get better faster. Um, and you suggested a number of therapies. 
um, and we're all looking for those therapies to help people recover faster. Um, we don't have good scientific evidence that anything helps people get better faster. It uh, doesn't mean there aren't some things that do. Um, and uh, I hope we'll figure it out better uh, as time goes on. Um, there's the, the, you can't take a group of these people who have concussions and provide a therapy and those people who have concussions and don't because they all are so individual. Yeah, hard, hard to have a control group for your intervention, for sure. Um, but there certainly is the, the growing thinking that there's specific people where some sort of therapeutic intervention is reasonable and where protocols for that are, are being worked out. And it specifically uh, is the case in people who have persistent difficulty with balance um, or people who have persistent difficulty with dizziness um, or people who have persistent difficulty with vision. And there are specific um, uh, oculomotor, vestibular, and, and balance therapy protocols that have evolved and are being applied to those subgroups. Uh, so while we don't really know uh, if those things are helpful, um, maybe in time we'll be able to figure that out. But at least the idea that there's some specific interventions for specific subgroups, that's become a popular idea. Dr. Capistran. Well, if you listen to ESPN, you get an imaging study the same day, no matter what's wrong with you. Uh, so that's what people have come to expect. Um, but panel, you have any ideas about that? So I think it kind of goes back to what we said, that there's not a test for a concussion. So I can do a CAT scan on every kid, but if it's not going to tell me if there's a concussion or not, I'm not sure that's the right thing to do for every kid. So there are risks to imaging studies. There are problems with imaging studies. So I think we use a, those tools and the history and those pieces of it, and if it fits with a concussion and we don't have other red flag symptoms, so those are that very abnormal neurologic exam. If your child looks like a cat in that picture with two different sized pupils, you're going to get a CT scan of your head to make sure it's not something very different than what we think it is. But if it really fits with a concussion and we don't have other red flag symptoms or other problems, it's probably not worth radiating your child's brain if it's not a test that's going to tell me that's what's going on. Yeah. I, I mean, I just, you know, the MRIs that you do, there's limited radiation for that. Yeah. But as you're saying, what's the point if it's not really going to show a concussion? But what about the neck? You know, I think you mentioned in your thing, your PowerPoint presentation, that the neck was almost always injured or something. You, you said something to the effect, you always look for neck injuries at the same time you're looking at a concussion because the head is obviously moved one way or the other. But a neck injury can't show up in an MRI either, can it? Because it's a bone. So how do you detect that? Is that an X-ray? I'll, I'll defer to Carrie. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, you um, know, it, so let's let's back up a step to to the question Dr. Capistrat asked. <clears throat> when should you when should you image someone with a head injury? Yeah. Okay. Because it's not just to prove that you have a concussion. It's to prove that you don't have something else that would be worse, right. okay? So in the very beginning, if someone has a seizure, if they have loss of consciousness for more than a minute, if they throw up more than once, um, if, if their headache's really, really bad, if, um, if their symptoms are getting worse over time, if they have a focal neurologic exam, uh, you know, one part of your body isn't abnormal, is abnormal, you know, I can't move my left arm, you're getting imaged, you know. Um, mm, what am I forgetting? Um, uh, slurred speech. Uh, think of anything else? Yeah. Awkward. 
What about Maybe that's the important thing for parents coming in with the child who is yeah. concussed. Because as awareness is raised, parents are like, oh, I think my child has a concussion. And they, they always want the best or whatever can be done. Mm-hmm. And it's important to know that they don't have a test for it, but that there, there are valid reasons that we may need to be tested. And right. That's what I've seen in practice. Sometimes you're trying to tell them when you don't need it, imaging and why you do it. Yeah. So those things wouldn't prove you have a concussion, but they'd help you to know that you didn't have something else uh, bad. Um, and the best way to image the injured brain in the first 24 hours is to do the CT. And when you do the CT of the brain, if you have any question about a spinal injury, then you easily CT the, the neck at the same um, yeah the neck at the same time, and that's a great way to look for bony injury. You know, uh, so after 24 hours, the MRI is imaging. Uh, uh, choice for looking at the head because um, uh, smaller bleeds and cerebral edema show up better on the MRI than they do on the CT. And the MRI gives you better information about the spinal cord and the discs than the CT does. So depending upon what kind of injury you're suspecting in the neck, it may be useful to do the MRI. Wouldn't it mostly so, be like some kind of a whiplash injury in the neck? Does that show up on the well, no, the whiplash injury is an injury to the muscles. And oh. if you thought someone had a muscular injury to their neck, you wouldn't image their neck. But if you thought they had a spinal injury, not a neck injury, because the neck includes the muscles and everything, okay. but if you specifically think it's the spinal column, the vertebral column, or the contained uh, cord or nerve roots, you know, those are things you'd want to image. Well, it depends what you're looking for. The CT would be the best way to look at the bone. And if you're there, a CT in the head in the first 24 hours, and you're concerned about the neck, might as well CT the neck at the same time. CT costs less. It's very rapid. You don't have to take the helmet off. You don't have to take the pads off. It's great information. But if you're more interested in injury to the cord or the disc, then the MRI is going to be more helpful. And I think, you know, when when a parent says... I don't care what you say. I want a CT of his head. I'd do it. I wouldn't argue with him about it, you know. So if it turns out good, everybody's happy, you know. If it turns out there's a problem there and we discovered it, great. If you didn't do it and the kid got worse, ooh, you'd have trouble defending that. But um, what's good medicine is to, is to do it the times we talked about. And I think it's just also important to remember that the CT scan is not a benign thing, especially in a young developing brain as mm-hmm. well. So it's not, we just do it to say we did it, that it, there are also risks to doing that. So it's weighing those risks and benefits depending on the kid. I have a question. Yeah. Um, this is more, more or less for Dr. Keller. What are, what are your thoughts as far as um, um, People who have concussions, like college athletes, they're more prone to lower extremity injuries within after having a concussion. Do you see that a lot um, in your practice? Let's say you have a concussion, um, that they're more likely to have a like four times, almost four times as much of a lower extremity injury. Can't say I've been aware of that. Oh, okay, it's from um, the University of Florida. Mm-hmm. So, I just figured, you know, that's, you know, the brain is not quite sharp and semi brain parts, and it's not, you know, they're not performing right physically. What period of time after the concussion uh, was the lower? 90 days after mm-hmm. experiencing a concussion. Athletes were 3.7 times more likely to experience a muscle or ligament injury than their non concussed teammates. Uh-huh. I'll pay more attention to that. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I just kind of thought, okay, that's still, you know, with the brain part, you know, we all trip on that lint on the floor, and that's, I mean, as a physical therapist, that's what I always call them. Yeah, that's a brain part, you know. Uh Your brain just is not, you know, reacting. I guess it'd be hard to know for sure who'd had a concussion and who hadn't. You know, are the people in your control group really non-concussed? Yeah. Um, That's true, yeah. Well, they're all all soccer players, so only some of them have had injuries before. Robert? I just, I just want to, we're taping this, so I'm, I'm wondering if we could do some closure around 8.30.
And then if people have other questions, if the panelists have time, I'm, I invite you to stay and ask the questions. But we're trying to take this and, and so that we have a kind of a, a good closure uh, at that time. So we have about five more minutes for questions. But that segment, that is, you're welcome to, uh, to continue to pose the panel. So OK, panel, is there anything else you'd like to cover in the final five minutes? Mr. Keller, uh, you know, there's a lot of advertisement nationally for uh, helmets that reduce concussions or prevent concussions or mouthpieces that prevent concussions or uh, slip-on pads for helmets to prevent concussions. Do they really prevent concussions? Um, yeah, unfortunately, um, uh, there are lots of people who take advantage of any opportunity to earn a buck. And, um, and there are many products that have come out uh, claimed to uh, prevent concussions. Uh, I was trying to show you some pictures of some here. Um, That's your daughter. Yeah. yeah. My, my son thinks that she's really hot. Huh? <laughs> I'll, I'll let her know. I'll, <laughs> okay. I think she already knows. <laughs> I'll leave that to him to figure out. Uh, yeah. um, and uh, and there have been many manufacturers who've come up with all sorts of different things. <clears throat> um, there's no scientific evidence that any of those things are of any value at all. Um, and. Um, and every year, uh, the NFHS and their Sports Medicine Advisory Committee go through a lengthy review of what data manufacturers can provide. Um, and uh, as yet, no one's providing any data that these things uh, are really of any help. Um, uh, you'll, uh, if you go to one of the Eielson football games this year, you'll see that they're all wearing um, some foam rubber on their helmets uh, in the hope that that'll decrease the risk of concussion. Um, and again, that product uh, doesn't have any data to support that it, that it has any effect. What about bike helmets? Are they any good? Well, it's pretty clear that helmets of any kind don't prevent concussion. That's why we have five and a half million concussions in athletes every year. Um, and they were never designed to prevent concussion. They were designed to try to prevent skull fractures and intracranial bleeds and those sorts of things. Um, um, apparently, they're not doing too bad a job of that. But they sure aren't protecting against concussions, because we have a whole lot of concussions in people wearing helmets. Uh, so there's good reason to wear the helmet, but it's not to prevent a concussion. Don't think you're going to prevent a concussion by wearing a helmet. But I want you to prevent your skull fracture and everything. There's every reason to wear that helmet. Yeah. We had a question in the back, Dr. Keller. There was just a thing on the, on the radio talking about these helmets, and they forced some of these companies to quit claiming things because they, they, there was no proof on it, and they were keeping saying this will do this, and they made them stop. Yeah, unfortunately they haven't stopped, but uh, I agree with you, and I heard that on the radio too, and Chris, you saw an article or something recently about the FTC uh, adopting a more aggressive policy? Yeah, FTC is going after a lot of those companies, and the state of Minnesota just introduced legislation to make it a crime in the state to advertise an item as concussion, reducing or concussion preventing without data to back up. So we're headed in the right direction. Well, I'm going to thank everybody. Oh, you talked about physical trauma, but I remember some math problems in high school that caused headaches. <laughs> I think I was concussed. I think I have a good case for that. Give us a round of applause for our students. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much to my panel. I really appreciate you all being here tonight. I had a pleasure to be sitting next to Rachel Thomas, who was in charge of women's athletics at UAF for several years. But the reason I'd like to bring this up, just a few hours ago, she won the first prize in tennis at, Arctic, at the uh, senior game. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>
Show to some kids uh, in the villages. Sure. I think what we're going to ask.